Well, on the first day of trading after Joe Biden became the president-elect, we saw the Dow experience its biggest rally in just five months. But my next guest says investors should not rest easy. There is plenty of time for global and market instability before Inauguration Day. He is Kim Iskian, and he comes to us now from Ireland. Kim, you're the international editor at Stansbury Research. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jessica. So, Kim, we know that President Obama told President Trump, for example, in the transition between those two governments, that North Korea was going to be his most pressing problem. What dangers from a market instability standpoint does North Korea pose to investors right now? And what's the track record, uh, the sort of connection the market makes between North Korean missile activity and experimentation and testing and market uncertainty? Well, Jessica, between, I mean, there's always a scope for geopolitical jitters from everything from uh, Turkey to Iran to North Korea. And I think what we're seeing right now, kind of in, the, in that gray area, lame duck time between presidents, it's kind of, a, in some ways, it's almost unprecedented because we do have a lot of uncertainty about Donald Trump conceding, which has not happened yet. And, uh, and, and we've seen that Donald Trump also takes a very unorthodox approach to foreign policy. And if he thinks that this is his last, kind of his last weeks, he has less to lose. And it might be the time to settle some scores and see what happens. And I think with North Korea in particular, what we've seen over the past several years is that North Korea is a bit of a blackjack and you're never quite sure when they're gonna fire off a missile and what kind of reaction there's gonna be. I think we can probably assume that if they were to do something like that in the next nine, 10 weeks, there would be less, a less severe reaction from the United States than there might be in 12 weeks with a new government in place in the US. And that sort of thing, the thing is, it's a fat tail risk, right? Does it devolve into a war? Does it actually do something that really upends the international order? Or is it just another missile that's fired? History tells us that it's just another missile that's fired, and there's been a short-term, there have been short-term market um, corrections, not even corrections, just a few days, but it hasn't lasted. My money is on that happening, but I think the risks of things happening in North Korea or elsewhere are a whole lot higher right now than they have been uh, for a long time. And are they made higher, in your view, because we've also just had the defense chief get fired by tweet by the U.S. president? Well, yeah, the Secretary of Defense is one more kind of obstacle or hurdle that the President of the United States has to navigate in order to, to uh, execute foreign policy in a sense, right? Um, I want to ask you about China because um, the, the Chinese media has been very excited by the prospect of a Biden presidency. Um, but um, in my view, that's a little bit of a false hope that, that the Biden presidency is going to be any easier on the on the US China relationship, I think certainly rhetorically, but not necessarily changing the tools it uses. Um, that said, I wonder what you think about the prospect of saber rattling from China, maybe not in the military sense, but uh, maybe in the trade sense or just act going through uh, the South China Sea, some other areas that are in, in um, or Taiwan, uh, just kind of being a little provocative. What do you think the chances of that are now? Yeah, I think that could certainly happen. And uh, China is very good at pushing its advantage and sensing a weak point and kind of pressuring that. And why not? It's, it's most likely the final weeks of the Donald Trump administration. Um, and maybe China just wants to put the Biden government administration a little bit on its back foot. Say, okay, now how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna cope with this? I agree with you. I don't think policy will actually be all that different except stylistically. Um, I think that one of the things that Donald Trump did have right with respect to China was that they were getting away with things they should have been getting away with. And he, he certainly has made a lot of big steps to stop that. And I think the next government in the United States is pretty much going to continue along that line. The Biden administration, um, it's, they want to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and I wonder how that uh, figures into any calculation Iran might make during this period of time, right? Because um, obviously under Trump, the U.S.-Iran uh, rapprochement was stopped cold and, uh, and, and became much more adversarial, including strikes on uh, sovereign territory by the Americans. Um, so how do you see the sort of dangling that we're seeing from the Biden administration of, hey, we'll rejoin this, this agreement that we know you liked, it helped your economy, um, playing into the prospects of, uh, of any risky behavior by the Iranians and thus any risk to the markets? Yeah, if I'm Iran, I think I'm going to 
going to keep my nose clean for the next several weeks to the extent possible because there's little there's little upside to to doing something that would disturb um, the U.S. at this point. And I think the, the more of the risk is from the American side because the Trump administration has been a very good friend of the Middle East, certainly of Saudi Arabia. So to the extent that any sort of help or any kind of nod in that direction uh, can be achieved by rattling Iran's cage, all the better. And if that also makes it more difficult for the uh, nuclear, um, for what you mentioned, for the nuclear deal to be back on, all the better in terms of, uh, as far as Donald Trump is concerned, because that makes it anything that, that an outgoing government can do to tie the hands of the incoming government. We've seen historically that sometimes happens, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happened this time. All right, lastly, um, I guess overall, what, what would you put um, the market sentiment at with respect to the uh, potential for these kinds of risks being destabilizing? I mean, I, I see the, the markets day to day really reacting to domestic concerns, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's the, the state of play on COVID or um, the state of play really on whether we have a, a concession speech and a, a president elect officially or not. Um, how long before we potentially see the markets react to something other than domestic concerns over this period of time? I think there has to be something that happens. A missile fired, um, troops pulled, something, something big and splashy. Because there is, uh, when you have just waves of money from the Fed, when you have all this news about COVID, all the domestic issues and, and politicking, that is still going to very much more call the shots. And I think something has to actually happen, whether a a pipeline blows up or something like that, that would, uh, it would cause investors to really focus on anything outside of what's going on in the United States right now. All right. Tim Miskin, our thanks to you. Thank you for joining us with your insights. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Jessica. You can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thanks for watching. I'm Jessica Stone.